rest of you, I would ask you to turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 3. That's where we're going to be camping out today. We began a series last week on hearing and responding to the Word of God. And it would happen that one of the passages for this week in the lectionary, which is a, some readings a lot of churches preach through throughout the year, this passage, um, I didn't choose this. It came into us from that lectionary. There's thousands of churches around the world preaching out of this. It just happens to be about a young boy hearing the voice of God for the first time. It's exactly where we need to go as a church this morning as we talk about hearing and responding. So I'm going to read out of the NIV. It'll be on the screen. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So Samuel went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called, Samuel! And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this scripture. We pray that you would guide my words to reflect your truth. Guide our hearts to understand your scripture more. That we would know your son Jesus Christ more and more as we go through this service today. Speak to each and every one of us by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, communication is key? You ever heard that phrase before? We say this a lot in pre-marriage counseling. This is something that uh, my childhood youth pastor used to say. He would say when they did pre-marriage counseling, he would tell the couple, we're getting the conversation started, and the conversation should never stop. It's just another way of saying communication is key. Now, if you've ever been in a relationship with someone, romantic or just a friendship, maybe you have a sibling, a parent, you know that if you two can't communicate, the relationship isn't going to be very steady, right? Whether it's romantic or not, whether it's just a friend, a coworker, when communication isn't steady, the relationship isn't steady. Communication is key. Well, this is really difficult when we're busy people. And this is true for Pastor Bree and I. My wife, Bree, we, uh, we get very focused on what we're doing when we're working. We both are able to kind of hyperfixate and really zoom in and it's like everything blocks out and we can just focus. The problem is when the other one needs you and you're so focused you can't really hear what they're saying. So we'll be in separate rooms around the house and we'll start yelling at each other to be heard. Now the trouble is it's hard to yell without sounding mad, isn't it? So I'm not, I'm, not upset. I'm not upset that she's busy. She's not upset that I'm busy. But the louder we get, the harder it is to believe that, oh, I'm not mad. I just, I thought you couldn't hear me. Sometimes I make the mistake of starting loud when I have her full attention. I do this all the time. One of the tricks I finally picked up over the, over the three and a half years of marriage is to say her name before I say the thing. It's a great trick. She's like, Brianna, what? And then fill it in, and then she knows I'm talking to her. But communication is key, and even when the information is good, depending on how we communicate it, the other one can feel like, why are you mad? Why are you yelling? What's going on? I was just busy. I wasn't paying attention. 
Well, here's what's difficult about communication. When we talk about communication skills and learning to communicate, we often think of something like this, like public speaking or writing a letter. Maybe if you work in a company that has an HR department, maybe sometimes you get told you have to work on the way you communicate. But it's almost always talking about the way we say things to each other. Communication's almost always in our head about how we get an idea across to someone else. But here's the thing about good communication. It's a two-way street. It's a conversation. More important than just learning how to talk in a relationship is learning how to listen. Now, if you don't know what listening is, it's different than hearing. Hearing, we're talking about hearing the voice of God and responding to the voice of God. Listening is different than hearing. And you can hear someone say something. When Bree yells across the house for me, to, for me to hear what she's saying, I hear her. But if I'm not listening, I don't understand what she's saying. I'm not paying attention. See, listening is hearing with a willingness to change. Let me say that again. Listening is hearing with a willingness to change. To change your behavior, to change what you think, even just to change your posture and how you're spending your time to just focus and listen to somebody else. So it's not enough for communication to just be talking. It's great if we can all say things really well, that's fantastic. And it's not just enough to hear. I mean, we can, we can you know, clean the wax out of our ears so we can hear each other well, but that's not enough either. In a relationship, we need to learn to listen. We need to hear the other person well and let what they have to say affect the way we behave. Now, this is true of our relationship with God. And this is a new dynamic for the young boy, Samuel. See, Samuel is already used to talking to other people. He understands what it means to worship God. He's serving in the temple. He's been serving in the temple since he was a young boy. And he's grown up serving God. He already knows how to behave like a good person person in the family of God. He already knows how to go through the motions of worship, but what Samuel hasn't learned yet is how to discern the voice of God. He doesn't even recognize it. So much so that when he hears God speak, he runs to Eli. Now, before we get down on him, no, it's not that he doesn't know how to hear God's voice because he's a child, because as we see in the Gospel of Luke, the first person in the Gospel of Luke to respond to the Christ child is the unborn child, John the Baptizer. So it's not his age, it's not like eventually you're old enough, you know, you hit puberty, now you can hear the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work like that. There's something else going on here. Because at the start of our passage today, it says, in those days, most people didn't hear from God. There weren't a lot of visions. This wasn't just one boy who was the only one in the community of faith who didn't get it. This was a, a group of people who struggled to hear God well. Maybe God was talking the whole time, but at least they weren't listening. So Samuel hasn't learned this skill yet. Maybe he would have younger, maybe not. I find it hard to believe this is the first time God's ever spoken or moved in his life, but... But maybe it is, and, and because of that, he doesn't recognize the voice. So when he hears the voice, he does what many of us would do. If you heard a voice in the house, if you were at home and you heard a voice in the house, you'd live with someone else, you would probably assume it's them. Even if it didn't sound like them, that's probably your first guess. So when he hears the voice of God, he runs to Eli, and he wakes him up. He says, Eli, I'm here. What, what do you want? Eli tells him, I, I didn't call for you. Go back to bed. Eli's probably irritated. He's like, what are you doing waking me up in the middle of the night? Come on, Sam, go back to bed. Well, it happens again, and, and Samuel runs back to Eli, and he's like, Eli, wake up. I heard. What do you want? Eli's like, listen, I did not call you. Go back to bed, boy. Come on. A third time this happens. Finally, Eli, even though in those days, People were not used to hearing the voice of God. Even though if we read the rest of 1 Samuel, Eli is a wicked man who is unfaithful to God. He knows enough to know that this must be God talking to this boy. And he tells him to go back and be prepared that when God calls again to say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Now, I want to point out something that maybe we breeze past in this story. It's an exciting story. 
It's easy to just get excited at the thought of God speaking to us and, and learning to hear that and discern that and listening to it, responding to it. But one of the things that I want to draw out of this story before we move on is this really key dynamic in living the Christian life. And it's this. We can learn to hear God's voice. It's something we can learn to do. It's a skill we can develop. It's a capacity in ourselves. It's like a muscle. We, can, we may be born with the ability to turn to God. By the grace of God, we have the ability to turn toward God and respond. But the ability to hear that often is something we can cultivate in ourselves. By the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can learn to hear God's voice. Like any other skill, we can grow in this skill over time. This is really important. Because oftentimes I've found, as, as a pastor and as a Christian, I joke around that I'm a career Christian, just it's the only thing I could turn into a job growing up in the church was doing church for a living. I've been doing this a long time, maybe not as long as some of you, but this is all I've ever done, so, so take this for what it's worth. Often we treat the things of faith completely different than we treat the other things in life. And that brings us a lot of shame, and I'm going to explain why. If you walked into the gym down the street today and loaded up a bar to bench press 400 pounds, show of hands, who could do that today? A couple people? Maybe one rep, Rob? We probably couldn't do that. Now, you walk into a gym, there might be someone in there who could do that. And we might feel kind of bad. This is something that happens at gyms a lot. Actually, Planet Fitness built their whole platform on no gym intimidation. It's, it's a gym where no one really, like they get rid of all the heavy stuff so that people who are really scary and, and look like they're kind of like on something aren't, aren't there intimidating you. But it would be ridiculous for you to walk in there, realize you can't bench 400 pounds, and feel bad about it. Isn't that a ridiculous idea? Isn't it kind of strange that, that if you, who here, who here only speaks English? Nothing to be embarrassed about, I only speak English. Wouldn't it be unfair to you if today you wanted to learn Spanish and the fact that you can't speak it fluently, you just, you were grieved by that and you, you just beat yourself up and you just couldn't stand it because you have this desire to be able to do that. Now, if I go into a gym or if I go, say, I, before I trained for the marathon or even today, I'm not in shape to run a marathon, but if before I trained for the marathon, if I'd showed up to one and tried it, and failed, it would, be easy, it would be ridiculous for me to beat myself up for not being capable of doing that. Because it takes time. Even if you want it just as badly as someone else, these things take time. You might want to bench 400 pounds. But I got to tell you, it's probably not good for your health to try and do that today. Even if you did it, you'd be sore. You might get injured. It's difficult. Try learning a new skill. If you know someone who's been to physical therapy, it's good for you, but man, it hurts. It's difficult. Learning to hear the voice of God is like this. Before the shame sets in of, oh man, I can't hear God like, like they can, you know. When they pray, it's like, oh, the heavens open and they just hear God's voice and it's so clear for them. If you've been around other Christians, you hear their stories, it may feel like you're the one missing out. But first things first, that's probably the highlight reel of their life. You know, when people share their testimony, it's not fair to compare every single day to someone else's testimony. Even the scriptures, this is a snapshot of Samuel's life. But we need to diffuse that shame around learning to hear God's voice, or we might just avoid the very practices that help us get there. It's not about how much you want it. God is not questioning your willingness. You're not being punished. Like any muscle or any skill, it takes time to develop. This is really important. Because I think the enemy of your soul, the enemy of the church, wants to stop us from doing the things that help us hear God. It is too easy to stop doing the practices that help us hear God because it's not working or it's uncomfortable. It's an acquired taste. I gotta tell you, the things of faith are an acquired taste. Sitting still 
is an acquired taste. Reading a book that was written for a culture that's so different than ours is an acquired taste. If it's difficult at first, you are in good company. For Jesus' disciples, the 12 disciples, it was difficult for them, and they spoke the same language, they'd been raised in the same faith, they grew up in the same area, and they were face to face with Jesus, and they still had trouble. It took years and years for them to figure out the things that they have written in the scriptures. So that's okay. I need to name that first, first things first. As your pastor, I want you to hear it from me. It's okay to be a work in progress when it comes to the things of faith. It's not a reason for shame. This is something we can work on together. And actually, if we want to learn how to hear the voice of God, one of the first ways we can do that is by being together. We can hear God's voice in a lot of different ways. I'm just going to pick out a few for today. The first one is this. We can hear God's voice by being in community, being with other people. If you look at the scripture, we, you may think that it's always something like this where God just speaks to the person. But did you notice that Samuel needed help? He went to Eli and Eli directed him to God. Even when God spoke to him, God used another person. This happens all throughout the scripture. This happens with Samuel and Eli. This is true when King David goes off the rails and is living in sin and the prophet Nathan comes and speaks to him and gives the word of God to him so he can repent and be faithful. This happens with Paul and Timothy in the New Testament. Some of our books of the New Testament are from that relationship. It wasn't that Timothy wasn't serious or genuine. It's that he was newer to this than Paul was. He needed a mentor. And Paul was that mentor for him. A picture of this happening in the scriptures with two of, two of the main women in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. This happens with Elizabeth and Mary. Mary is processing something none of us will ever fully relate to. She is with child, with the Son of God. And she goes to a family member who's having a profound experience as well, who thought she was too late in her life to have a child, and then all of a sudden she's pregnant, and her husband can't speak, and this amazing story happens. And their stories collide in a way that Elizabeth is able to help mentor Mary, and their relationship helps them both. For many of us, this is our reality. And I want to say this is not a problem. This is something that I think we also feel shame about. Needing a mentor is not a cause for shame. Needing others to invest in our life and in our faith is not a cause for shame. I think sometimes we can be guilty the longer we're Christians of starting to think, okay, now the training wheels need to come off. I should be able to do it on my own. Just me and the Bible in a hammock by the lake. I don't need to go to, I shouldn't need church. I shouldn't need the sermons. I shouldn't need to have a prayer partner. I should be able to stand on my own two feet. Can I tell you, that goes directly against the truth of scripture. That doing it alone is not good. Actually, the very first time the phrase not good is used in the Bible is the phrase it's not good for humans to be alone. Everything's good up to that point, and a single human by themselves is the first thing God says, that's not good. That won't cut it. That is not my desire for the world. We need others if we're going to hear the voice of God. And this has been really true for me in my life. One of the things that I've, I've identified recently is the best seasons in my life, in my faith, in my marriage, and in my vocation as a pastor, whatever I'm doing, the best seasons in my life have been times where I've been well mentored, where I've had people on this journey with me. And it, I'm a pretty excitable guy. You may not notice it on Sundays. I try to like calm myself down a little bit and be a little reverent. But I'm a very energetic guy. And I'm a very zealous guy. Like if someone, one time someone told me that I was addicted to caffeine and I wasn't relying on the Lord, and I just stopped drinking coffee for like seven months. I'd like take this faith very seriously. I'm a little too intense. So when I was called to go back to school, I already have studied what I need to to be a pastor, but man, can I tell you, studying has been a, a gift to me, a way for me to hear God's voice. So I'm in school again, I'm in grad school to keep studying ministry. And when I first made that decision, when God first invited me into that, I had about two weeks till the semester started. It was August 2021. And I was so excited that God had said to go to seminary, to go to Nazarene Theological Seminary, that I was like, I think we're supposed to move to Kansas City. 
I think I'm supposed to go to Kansas City. Not just attend NTS, go to NTS. And I, I told Bree this, and I was like, I think we're supposed to move to Kansas City. Now, it's like two weeks before the semester starts. And I just started mentoring a young man who had a call to youth ministry. And we just got things rolling at the church we were serving at. And I have great friends on this Nazarene district and mentors. And, and we were just kind of settling in. I just got a new job. Bree just got a new job. It just, it was kind of a crazy idea. So I, I called my mentors. I called my friend Troy. I called my friend Drew. And they were like, whoa, okay, all right. Let's slow down. Let's slow down. And they started pointing out all the ways God was at work right where I was. And the same intense feeling of like, I need to go, that same assurance that I needed to pursue this next step, that, that next step that got me enrolled in, at the school. I felt that peace and that assurance while I was on the phone with my friend Drew, that the peace to stay. Now I was totally willing to do whatever God said and because of that, I assumed it was this crazy thing. <laughs> That's kind of in my nature. I'm a, I, again, I get really intense about this stuff. But through community, I was able to discern the right step forward. Now, that was August 2021. If you've been around a while and you're counting the days, that was just three months before I accepted the call here. So I knew God was stirring something, and I wanted to run at the first thing. But through community, I discerned to be patient. And by the grace of God, I was called here to this church, and, and I feel the same assurance, this is right where I'm supposed to be. But I needed community to get there, so I didn't just kind of go crazy. Now, I'm not saying it's crazy to be bold, but I'm just saying. If you're an intense person who deeply desires to be faithful, can I tell you, for the sake of your soul, you need other people in your life. God loves that you are delighted to be obedient, and God will bring people alongside you to be wise counsel in those moments of intensity and excitement. Now don't let them talk you out of what God's telling you to do. Let them be a part of the process. Another way we can hear the voice of God, and this is easy to miss, Samuel's in the house of God. He's not just in community with Eli, he's in the house of God. And it seems like this is the usual behavior for Eli and Samuel. They tend to be here. This is really important. Now I... I confess, as your pastor, I'm not good at um, being very parental and telling you to do what you need to do. So w when you're not here, I'm not going to I'm not gonna hunt you down. I'm not going to be like, oh, I can't believe you. But I want to I say to us this morning that for those of us who desire to hear God's voice more, maybe the first and most important thing for us to do is to be in the house of God together. Now, I understand things happen. I know that we have brothers and sisters in Christ, part of this church family, who just can't be here today. I get it. Work, working on a Sunday, for, for me, that means being here. For a lot of us, when we work on a Sunday, that means we can't be here. My heart breaks for that, and I know that's difficult. Again, not an opportunity for shame. We don't want the enemy to get a foothold here and shame us out of the very things that might help save us, that might transform us. But can I tell you, if you claim to want to hear the voice of God and you avoid the place that the people of God most commonly hear the voice of God, there might be two different things you want at the same time. And, and I get that. I get that we can really want one thing and also want another. I really don't want to clear off the car when it's like this. I get it. I don't have to commute here when the weather's bad. I just walk over here. I get that there's lots of things. You're raising families. You're busy. You have work. But if you're feeling a stirring to, to hear God's voice more, maybe committing to, to regular church attendance is the first step for that. That's tough. I would just as well have left that out of the sermon. It's not even in my outline. But as I was reading through the scripture this morning, I felt led to bring that back up and point out Samuel was in the house of God when he heard God's voice. And he knew the names of the other people who were with him and they were in community together. We do not want the enemy to get a foothold of shame about this. This is not shame that you haven't done better. This is an opportunity to experience God. It's a free gift from God, and the enemy wants nothing more than for you to feel bad and to avoid God. But that is, God is so loving. He wants you here so you can be with him. And I want to commit to you as your pastor to do my, my best to prepare well so that this is a time that I'm not in the way of God speaking to you, so that I'm prepared for these sermons. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off book here for some of this. Some of this stuff we'll come back to later in our series. But one of the things that I, I want to say that is really, really important that we learn about hearing the voice of God from this story comes from what Eli tells Samuel to say. Now Samuel wants to hear the voice of God, and, and he wants to know what this voice means, and he goes to Eli, and Eli says, this is God's voice. And let me explain to you what you do when you hear God's voice. When you hear God's voice say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Samuel does that. And if you keep reading, God speaks to Samuel. He speaks a prophecy over him. He speaks hope and vocation and purpose into Samuel's life. But it starts with Samuel's statement, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And remember, listening is hearing with a willingness to change. Now, Samuel didn't just want the good feeling that comes from hearing God's voice. Now, i got to tell you, if you commit to coming to church every Sunday of the year, there will be lots of times where you get that good, warm feeling. God's presence is so palpable at times. But if you want to hear God's voice more and more, committing to listen and respond is one way to do that. It says in James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. If we only hear what God says, we're deceived. If we respond, we're being faithful. In the Church of the Nazarene, we call this consecration. Consecration is setting aside something for God's purpose. So in the Old Testament, they would consecrate the temple. They would prepare it and set it aside and say, God, this is yours to do what you want with it. And almost every time God's response to consecration is to fill the consecrated thing and to make it holy. We call that sanctification, something being made holy. So if you feel a stirring to go deeper, Preemptive obedience might be the way to hear God's voice more and more. Committing to, Lord, whatever you want. I'm not going to just pray for an answer. I'm committed to your answer, Lord. Whatever you say, I will do. I've been in those moments. I've come to the altar in moments like that. When I was in college, I was on an improv comedy team, and, and I just felt God telling me to give it up. And those are my closest friends, and it was, I was the chaplain, so I'd pray for them. It was a ministry and I just, I was fighting it for months. And finally, I was at Kankakee First Church of the Nazarene during service, and I came to the altar, and I was so scared because I knew that coming to the altar meant it was yes no matter what. I was committing to answer yes to what God asked. And I knelt at the altar, and rather than tell me to give it up, God changed the way I engaged. He said, you better be there for the sake of others. Not so you can get laughs, not so you can be popular. You need to refocus on caring for other people. Now, when I went to the altar, I thought God was going to take away something I loved that had become an idol. And instead, God reshaped it and said, this is no longer an idol. It's a tool. It's a ministry. But I had to be willing to obey regardless of what it was going to be. That was the piece. My commitment to obey is what unlocked that moment, that made that moment possible. Listening is hearing with a willingness to change. So when we want to hear more of God's voice, I think that that's one of the greatest first steps is to say, Lord, whatever you say, I'm in. Whatever you call me to, I'm in. We in the Church of the Nazarene, we call this entire consecration. When you give your whole self to God, God, you can have all of it. You can have my finances. You can have my marriage and my relationships, my work, my relationships with my coworkers. You can have the way I spend my time. When you're ready to give everything to God, you offer it up to God. And the beautiful truth of the gospel is that when we offer ourselves to God, God fills us. He makes us holy. This preemptive obedience is what that looks like. If you want to hear the voice of God, committing to listen and obey is a great way to do it. I had a friend in college who uh, we would played intramural basketball together, and we were good friends, and we, were, we got lunch together, and I ended up, uh, he was in my wedding. He was a groomsman. And there was a point where I was sitting there studying, and what's weird about being a ministry major is you're studying the Bible and, like, theology stuff for class. So, like, everyone else is doing, like, geometry or something, I don't know what engineers do, but like math that like looks like Greek to me, I don't understand it, and I'm like 
reading a reflection on scripture. And I, I would get so emotional. I'd be like in the library and someone's like studying psychology 101. And I'm like in tears <laughs> because I'm studying for ministry. So I'd often get up and walk out. And I'd have to go somewhere else to pray. And on this day, I felt led by God to just go pray in the columbarium, which is, it's like a, where people's ashes are kind of like in a, this is going to sound weird. They're like safe deposit boxes, but for ashes. They have them over at, at, lake, at the lake over here in town. And they have people's names. And these ones are people who were friends of the university, people really close to the university where I went to school. And I saw the name of a man named Pastor uh, Ed Heck. Now, I'd never met Ed Heck. He had passed away from a heart attack my freshman year. But he had pastored the church I now went to, Kankakee First Church. And I realized in that moment that God had used his ministry to prepare a space for me to come to, even though I'd never met him. And I was just overwhelmed by the fact that ministry is like that, that we prepare spaces and we plant seeds we'll never know about. And I was visibly, I just, I wept. I came back to the library, and I clearly had been sobbing. My friend Mitch goes, Peter, are you okay? And I go, yeah, I just went to pray. And he's like, God, say anything cool? You know, Mitch is a really low-key guy. And I go, yeah, he just, and I share that story. And he goes, Peter, how come when you pray, God splits the heavens and like the nectar of the Lord like comes down. But when I pray, I get nothing. And, and I, was, I was joking at the time, but I've started to say this and be serious about it. And I looked at him, and, and this isn't a comment on his faith. People experience God differently. But I just looked at my friend and I said, listen, if you want to hear God more often, when he speaks, say yes as fast as you possibly can. Because you will waste six months telling God no to something you heard clearly. And he's ready to start telling you something else. And I think that that's what Samuel has done for us here. So often we desperately want to hear God's voice. And God's been really clear about something. But we don't like that answer. We're like, God, can you give me some info over here? He's like, listen, this is the next step. Oh, and we fight it. And we don't want it. We don't like it. That preemptive obedience. If you want to do that in your life, I encourage you in your time of prayer. If you don't have a time of prayer, I encourage you to find one. It could just be in your commute. It could be when you're at the breakfast table. Just say these words. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. It's a prayer of commitment. It's a prayer of commitment to what comes next. I gotta tell you, this is a bold prayer. But if you're ready to hear God's voice more, if you feel like, I've, you know what, God's been drawing me deeper, but what does deeper look like? This prayer of consecration, saying, Lord, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Not just hearing. I'm gonna hear what you have to say and I'm willing to change. That might be for you, what, what is that exercise, that physical therapy for hearing the voice of God? We're going to talk more about hearing the voice of God in the weeks ahead. Next week, we have a special treat. Pastor Chad Gibbons and Crystal Gibbons will be here sharing from the field and also bringing the word to us in the sermon. They might be on the same topic, but we'll come back the next week either way, and we'll, we'll keep talking about this. I have to tell you, if this is feeling exciting, stick with that feeling. If it's feeling heavy, there might be room for repentance. Maybe there's things that God has said and we've resisted. But repentance and shame are different. Repentance is an accepting of relationship with God that's already been offered to us. John Calvin says, we only ask for forgiveness because we already know the answer is yes. There's no room for shame. But if you are looking for more, an opportunity to do more, to hear the voice of God, not to, not to earn it, not to prove something, not to show God that you've been so good, you deserve it, but just to grow that muscle, to hear the voice of God. Pray that prayer. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And be patient and see what happens. Have I spoke the truth this morning? I want to invite you, if you're in a position where you're looking for ways to hear the voice of God, I didn't preach on it, we're going to preach on it in the weeks ahead, but if you're looking for a way to get started in reading the scripture, I did the math, and if you start reading 
chapter 1 of Matthew, one chapter a day, today or tomorrow, you will finish the book of Matthew just in time for the season of Lent, which is the season where we prepare our hearts for Easter, where we express our need for God. So if you're like, I want to read more of the Bible, I don't know where to start, start with Matthew chapter 1. Read one chapter a day, and that could be a great first step. I'll be doing that alongside you each day so that we can, we can be immersed in the same thing. Well, church, I would love to pray with you. I, I, I hope this is heavy in the right way, that this is an invitation for you and for us this year. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we come to you today. We express our desire to hear you more. We know there's lots of voices competing for our attention in the world today, and, and many of them lead us astray and lead us to hurt and to pain and Sometimes even our own desires hurt us and we, we feel that we are not all we've been made to be. Lord, we know that in some way that it starts with hearing your voice. So God, we pray today that you would speak. Lord, your servants are listening. God, we pray for this year ahead. Would you speak when we gather in this room? God, we want to come into this space prepared to respond to you. We want to come into this space expecting to hear from you. We consecrate this space for the weeks ahead. That when we come to church together, our hearts and minds would be open for your voice. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. God, for those of us who've been feeling a stirring, much like my stirring to, to move, and I thought it was to Kansas City, it turns out it was to Howell, Michigan. Lord, that unnamed stirring, that sensation that you're bringing us deeper, yet we don't know what it means, would you give us the strength to pray that prayer of consecration? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Would you remind us to pray this often, to pray this every day? As we're looking in the mirror, as we're driving to work, as, as we're eating our breakfast, as we're with our loved ones, as we're alone in our moments of silence, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would protect us from the shame that the enemy levies against us. Would you guard our hearts so that we can do this work together? Would you protect us? Holy Spirit, God, would you protect us that we might hear your voice more and more? Help us to sift out the distractions. Help us to slow down. Help us to be still and to hear you speak. And God, as we dive into your scripture, we confess that Many of us have not read the scripture as well as we would like to. But we relinquish the shame around that and we accept the invitation to know you more. Thank you that you give us the scripture. Thank you that you love us so much you want to speak to us. Would you speak to us as we read your word in the days ahead? Would you speak to us as we pray? Would you speak to us as we go from this place? Lord, we want to be a people who hear and respond to you. We want to be a people who expect you to speak. Would you speak to us this week? We pray these things together in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Church, if you're able to comfortably stand, I want to invite you to your feet as we pray a blessing over you this morning. If you have your offering with you this morning, you can give online. We have bins by the door to deposit your offering. We'd love for you to, to worship God in that way, but as we go, would you hear this blessing? Would you receive this blessing? May you know the God who wants to speak to you. The God who wants you to hear his voice. May the Holy Spirit guide you and protect you as you learn to hear God's voice each and every day. And may you be encouraged to listen for the voice of God. Empowered by the Holy Spirit to respond in faith. And may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Church, it is in that hope you are sent back into God's good world. Hug somebody, tell them you love them. We'll see you next week.